Welcome to New Hope's teaching ministry. You see, for me and my house, I'm determined not to let Christmas spoil everything. You get now, hang on, you got to listen to me, listen. Because as you know, you can get so crowded out. I mean, you can send me as many presents as you like. I will send you a list if you want. But I don't want anything to crowd out Jesus from my life. There's a, a cartoon sketch on one of the social media thing, and uh, it went something like this, that um, there was no room for them in the inn. You know, the, the classic narrative of this time, right? And, and the way they'd gone, there's no room. There was a big sign up. This is a prophetic conference, understanding the, t the signs of the times. But there was no room. For Jesus. And so we can be so caught up. And not have room for him. And that is my prayer. And so that is one of the reasons I wanted us to. Just engage with one another. And see the presence of God. In one another. When we have communion. Which says we recognize the body of Christ in one another. We discern the body of Christ in one another. He is here. There's a whole bunch of people here in this room right now. That's oozing out the presence of God. Don't miss it. Amen. Now I'm going to be, try not to be too enthusiastic. Because we were at an event yesterday. And the guy was very enthusiastic. And I thought, am I like that? Gosh, and in my pants. So I, I, I'll, <laughs> I'll try my best. Anyway, we're here. And we'll be back later for our candlelit carol service. I went out with the leaflets on Friday morning. And we don't have a lot of thousands of leaflets anymore we do it through social media we do it through you inviting people personal touch but you know it was so great and I said to God would you tell me it was almost like super spiritual Freddy you know but would you tell me which street to go down and go up here go left and, and I started meeting people and engaging with people uh, and if everybody comes that made a promise to come put more chairs out but it was so good to get out there and share the presence of God with people he is here he is here so in the midst of all this we continue or conclude our series on the uh, in Advent Advent, remember we talked Advent is uh, a season of expectant waiting. And if you're in a household where there's children, there's an Advent calendar and each time there's a little chocolate in there. They can't wait to open the next one and the next one and the next one. Or if you're in a household where there's grown-up children, they can't wait to open the next one and the next one and the next one. Have a great time, guys. Wow. Okay. But this is supposed to be a time where we get rid of the hindrances that clutter our lives. And sometimes the very thing itself clutters our lives. Um, we do this so that we can fulfill our potential. I, I'm going to have a little moan, okay? Is that right to have a moan Sunday before Christmas? But... Even on Christian radio, I am tired, and some Christian ministries, it being called holiday season. Come on. There wouldn't be a holiday season if it wasn't for Jesus. It's Christmas time. And 
It's the Christmas season. And as for me and my house, it's not going to be hijacked. Amen? Amen? It's Christmas season. And I came across this, even on, as I say, on the radio, and some big ministries in America, you know, this holiday season. What are you doing? Compromising, watering down. It's about Jesus. Get over it. Okay, come on. I feel better for that anyway. <laughs> but the waiting is nearly over. We've been waiting in this season, these weeks, and the waiting is nearly over. And this is what we've been looking at. Hope, peace, joy, and today, love. Advent, love, the greatest gift. The greatest gift you can give to anybody is love. It, what can I give him, poor as I am? I will give him what? My heart. I always laugh at that, Carol, because if I was a wise man, I thought, if only... But we can give our heart. And if there's ever a time to give your hearts to Jesus, it is now. And you say, well, that's wonderful, Pastor. You're an evangelist. Go and tell the lost. I'll tell you, there's some unbelieving believers that need to hear this message. Give him. Yeah, let, right. Let's do it now. Lord Jesus, I decide to make room for you this season. This Christ Mass season. Take away the clutter, the debris. Help me. To make room for you. In Jesus name. In Jesus name. Did you pray it with me? Put your hands up if you prayed it with me. Praise God we're in revival. I can do the appeal right now. And you might say well that's good. Because we can have longer coffee break. The greatest gift. God's love. Is so big. <laughs> it's so wide. Do you remember the chorus? You youngsters. So. <laughs> so. So. Love. Can you sing it? The love. Don't call us. We'll call you. That's, that's good. That's really good. You can get. I don't know why Hillsong haven't done that. I really. It's, why haven't they done it? Praise the Lord. It is so amazing that he sent his son to die in our place. <coughs> this is from the Passion Translation. This is how much God loved the world. He gave his one and only unique son as a gift. Do you see that? So that everyone who believes in him will never perish but experience. Everybody say experience. You see, we know it in our head, but have we experienced it in our heart? 
experience everlasting, eternal life. Everlasting life in the here and now. The word life is zoe and it's the God kind of life. What an amazing gift. Now Jesus knows how to give. And he gives. Do you have a puzzle? Well, what should we give so and so? I thank God that my discernment doesn't have to go there because Jane does it all. I know I'm unusual. I'm, all the other men do it, don't you? <laughs> I, I, I came across something that the, 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 the guy said to the wife, you know, what have we given? <laughs> it was on Christmas Eve, you know. What, what could give? I mean, what would you give to a Majesty of the Queen? Well, she, she doesn't need any socks. <laughs> She's got everything, hasn't she? I guess if she was here, Your Majesty, she would say, "Just give me your loyalty." So what do you give God? He's got everything. Give him your heart. Give him everything. Because he gave everything. And. Oh. Please. Over 40 years ago, in 1972, I gave my life to Jesus. No, he, that, that's wonderful. That's wonderful to make that journey. And if you haven't made that journey yet, you need to make that journey and say, Jesus, come into my life. But he wants my heart and your heart every day. Every second of the day, he wants you. Because he gave the best, he wants you. You say, well, how do I do that? Well, you don't have to spend a long time in prayer. You don't have to spend a long time studying the Bible. You don't need to understand the Bible that well. Most of us don't. All you have to do is say, Jesus, I make room for you today. I want to carry your presence where I go. I make room for you. And then if you know what you're doing that day, if you've got a list of things that you've got to go to or visit or shops. Shops. Some people are crying about the internet shopping. Oh, I'm not. <laughs> it's great. No cues. <laughs> Just make room for him. Every, every day. What this amazing declaration of love. This greatest gift. John says, this is love. Not that we love God, but that he loved us. And sent him to be an atoning sacrifice for our sins. He loved us first. I remind myself of that every day. Lord thank you for pursuing me. Help me to pursue you. Why don't you say that with me. Thank you for pursuing me. Help me to pursue you. That's what love does. He pursued. And so we have to respond back. And he will not Make us. He's waiting. He loves you. That is the sense. And we'll talk about unconditional love in a minute. That's the sense where it's unconditional. He waits for you. This is what the Passion Translation says about that verse. This is love. 
He loved us long before we loved him. Long before. It was his love, not ours. He proved it by sending his son to be a pleasing sacrifice, sacrificial offering to take away our sins. Can I get you to meditate on these verses? Write down 1 John, if you want the references, I'll give them to you. 1 John 4.10, meditate this. This is the gift of God to us. I, I don't know what you're going through. I don't know what you're facing. I don't know what your challenges are. I don't know how you, what your bank balance like. I don't know what your health situation's like. But you know what? You can walk tall in life knowing that God loves you. You've got something because you are someone that God loves. And as Jane said at the beginning, he has no favorites. Well, he has me. I'm his favorite. You're his favorite. You're his favorite. Yeah. Sharon, you are his favorite. And God wants to say to you, you are his favorite. He looks on you and he loves you. Catch that. You got that? You're his favorite. But you're his favorite. He even likes Colin. It's good. <laughs> I like Colin. We all love Colin. The Apostle Paul writes this, that God demonstrates his love to us. His own love to us in this, that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. I, 40 odd years and I still don't get it. Do you get it? And I, I literally shook my fist at God if he was there. It's working on you, isn't it? <laughs> it's good. <laughs> Stop it. <laughs> Think about that. Why are you still in rebellion? Christ died for us. Christ, God's love is sacrificial. He seeks, he pursues. We've talked about that. And the father waits for the son. We see a, a picture of this in the Old Testament. And it's this. Isaiah 30 verse 18. Yet the Lord longs to be gracious to you. Therefore, he will rise up. It's like... You rise up. Are you, are you coming yet? He wants to rise up to see if you're coming. Are you in, are you in view? Yeah, I, I, could see, I could see Luke coming. There he is. God sees you, Luke. God's rising up and he's saying, Luke's coming. Wow. Do you get that? To show you how bad you are. Now it doesn't say that, does it? It rises up to show you compassion. Ah, oh, thank God that God rose up, got out of bed, and he looked at Freddie and he had compassion on him. Thank God for that, because I'd have been finished long ago. How many in this room would have been finished with me long ago? <laughs> For the Lord is a God of justice. Blessed are those who wait for him. You need to talk about justice because we talk about love and we get mixed up what that means because we translate it 
through a human emotional soppy romanticism of God's love. Now, don't get me wrong. He loves you. But it's not. God's not going, oh, dear. I'm longing for this person. I can't cope without them. Just get over yourself. God can cope very well without you. He doesn't want to. Advent love, it has to be experienced. You're going to taste your mince pies, your sausage rolls, your turkey, your beef, or whatever. And thank God for the generosity of people. There are people on the streets that are going to taste something. There are people that will be able to go to Matthew 25 and Salvation Army. There are people that are able to come here to Night Shelter and wherever other venues they have them. We thank God for that. And they can taste something that's real and that's tangible. But beyond that, God wants us to taste and see that the Lord is good. Okay, well we've said this, haven't we? But I'm going to say it again. Oh yes, I taste it. Oh, I remember. I remember sitting on that bale in Little Hampton in 1973 asking God to fill me with the Holy Spirit. Hearing people speaking in this heavenly language and it, they were Welsh so they sang in tune. And it was beautiful. And I wanted that. And I said, Lord, come. I want to taste. And I tasted. But God doesn't want me to re just to try and remember the taste. Now we had a meal. Last Sunday we had a meal. But you know what? I can't remember the taste. For the life of me, I can't remember what that meal tastes like. So you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to go from here. We're going to go home. And we're going to cook something. So I can taste again. Taste. And see. Today. That the Lord is good. You see, it's not easy to talk about real love, the real God kind of love. It, both from the speaker's perspective and from the listener's perspective. How do you put a handle on this? Because as we've said, it becomes, the Western church has romanticized this. And this cooing God... And we've got to kick it out of the church, friends. We've got to get real. You see, he rises up to show us justice. That's what grace is. It gives us something. Please come in. It gives us something. I tell you, I'm a, I am a definite crowd clearer. If you, I could do crowd control like that. They start looking in, I say, come in, they're gone. What a gift. Praise the Lord. Taste and see the Lord is good. So we've romanticized it. And so, and we get a distorted view of God's love. And a distorted view of God's love leads in two directions. Either, well, we, you know, can't, God can't be close like that, intimate. So we get this legalistic way. And performance. That's what the freedom in Christ is about. Not about performance, but how deal with 
the performance, the stuff in us. I, I'm trying to earn God's favor. That's legalism. God couldn't possibly love me. He'd love him, her, but not me. I used to think like that. Now the biggest shock of my life. When God says, no, it's you. You know the lottery finger? It, it could be you. Well, it was me. And I got the lottery. Hallelujah. No, I didn't get 75 million. That wasn't me. I got more than 75 million. Oh. Or the other side is, well, God loves us. He loves you. Doesn't matter what you do. Doesn't matter about your lifestyle. Doesn't matter who you're in a relationship with. Doesn't matter if you cheat. Doesn't matter if you, uh, you cheat in your business. Not pointing the finger at you. It doesn't matter if we lie. Because God loves us. There was a, a, an awful book out a couple of years ago called, the title's great, but the content of the book was rubbish. It's called Love Wins. Now, ultimately, it was about love wins, so we're all going to go to heaven anyway. That summarized the book. That's license. I, 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 I'm a, you know I'm a positive person, don't you? But I've got to say these things. I've got to say them. If we want revival, we've got to say the truth, haven't we? The problem with the church in the West, we reflect in the society that we're in. The problem is that we're trying to copy the society that we're in. And so... I'm not saying anything about any church anywhere. But sometimes a lot of people go to some of these churches because it's free and easy, baby. It doesn't matter. I could do what I like. Nobody's going to hold me to account. Oh, there's that word. Oh, my word, account. So we get a distorted license. Not James Bond license to kill, although it will kill the church. But license to do whatever you like, and God's just gonna be there. He loves me anyway. And he just he just if I find him a couple of seconds, he'll just say, Oh, come on, Freddie, it's okay. It's not okay. So, does God stop loving me? No. Does he like what I do? No. Not always. Does he like what's going on in my heart? Not always. Hello? Does he love his church? Yes. Does he love his church throughout the ages? Yes. Did he love his church when they went on the crusades and they murdered and pillaged? Singing hymns, marching round Jerusalem. Did he like that? No. Are you getting this? So that's why the love issue is a difficult one because you come over as puritanical. You know, the Puritans didn't have Christmas dinner. They fasted on Christmas Day and sang hymns and praises all day. Should we start it? No, no, we won't. <laughs> too late the turkey's already in there isn't it I mean, but the church in Galatia in the first century was under pressure and along these lines they were false teachers on the one hand there were those who said God loves you so if you sin it doesn't matter and on the other hand there were those that's the legalists that said you somehow have to earn God's blessing and do X, Y, Z. And then maybe, just maybe. And we see that in other religions. I'm not saying what those religions are. That some, if we keep these 
statutes. If we keep these principles, then maybe when that day, when we stand before him, he might say, all right, your good deeds outbalanced your bad deeds. That's a legalist. And that's what was going on in Galatians. That's what the book of Galatians is about. There's lovely chapters there. It take, don't take long to read it. But Paul said no to legalism and to license and a big yes to liberty, to freedom. And he said this. For freedom, Christ has set us free. Therefore, do not submit again to the yoke of slavery. The slavery of serving yourself and trading on God's grace. The slavery of somehow slavishly trying to please this despot of a God. <laughs> Just needs repairing now. <laughs> Wow, I've just had a revelation. <laughs> the greatest gift. The Bible says, God's love disciplines us. Ouch. I don't know what your views are on punishment and whether we should smack children and all that. I wouldn't want to get into that debate. We have grandchildren and there are views in the household that we don't always agree to. We don't want a distortion of abusing. Them. But somehow there is a correction involved in love. Proverbs says, because the Lord disciplines those he loves. That's true, brother, but that's Old Testament. It is. But you know, the, book, the Hebrew writer copies, echoes that exact verse and says in Hebrews 12, the Lord disciplines those he loves. Have you been disciplined by law? No, I don't mean punished. I'm talking about disciplined. Has you ever had a door shut in your face? Do you know it's because he loves you? Have you ever said something and then afterwards you got that? Oh, I shouldn't have said that. Am I the only one in this room? That's the Holy Spirit, you see. Why? Because he loves you. That's what love is. But we have to experience it for ourselves. And then share it with others. And so Paul says this famous prayer. In Ephesians. And I pray this prayer nearly every day. I pray that you being rooted and established in love may have power together with all the Lord's holy people, the saints, to grasp. Get your hand, put your, let's, let's act this out. Put your hand out and then I want you to, as if there's something like a baton or a stick or something, I want you to grasp that. To grasp I want to grasp. I want, the word is comprehend in the other versions. I want to grasp it. I want to know it. I want to know this love. How wide. How deep. How high. We got when this thing's out of the way. How long is the love of Christ? I want to grasp. He put it in as a prayer, a Holy Spirit prayer, because we don't just get it when on the street when somebody comes up and says, Do you know God's got an amazing plan for your life and He loves you? As we do in the turning. And they take them through the gospel that all have sinned, the wages of sin is death. 
but the free gift is eternal life in Christ Jesus. And all who call on the name of the Lord will be saved. And we lead them into that prayer. But you know, they haven't grasped it. Forty odd years down the line, I'm still... Have you grasped it? Have you got it? No, I don't know. We, we, I want to know this love. Because when we know this love, what, what we believe will affect our behavior. Our behavior will reflect the love of God. Evangelism tool 101. Simple. We just, oh, I want to grasp it. I want to get it. Some people say, well, I can see it in you. Well, I can see it in me. But I want more. I can see it in you. And you want more. Anybody want more? We want more. What we need is a good dose of the love of God. Okay. And to know this love that surpasses knowledge, that we may be filled moderately so, that we might be filled to the measure of the fullness of God. People say, I want to be filled with the Spirit. Well, I want to be filled with the Spirit. Well, you're filled with the Spirit because the Spirit, of, the Holy Spirit is the Spirit of love. God is love, Father is love, Jesus is love, Holy Spirit is love. So we're asking to be filled with love. So you can't be speaking in tongues and then doing other stuff that shouldn't be you doing. There's only room for God. That is love come and flush out all that unwelcome stuff that's unhelpful. Now, this is my summary, as I summarize what I've just said, of the most famous verse in the Bible. You know the most famous verse? For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son, that whoever believes in him will not perish, but have eternal life. Who will have eternal life. God so loved, that's his motivation. That he gave, that's the gift. That whoever that's inclusive, that believes that's our response, not perish, that's our condition. John 3, 17 says, God didn't send his son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. Why would God send anybody to hell? Well, he never does and he never has. They're already going. He rescues us that not perish, have eternal life. And that is God's life. Paul says, I've been crucified with Christ. It's no longer I who live. But Christ lives in me. The life I now live in the body, I live by faith in the Son of God. Say with me, who loved me and gave himself for me. Taste and say that the Lord is good. Please would you stand? So, after you've, like me, felt what's in the present, and then open it, see what you've got. Well, the presence is here, that God's presence is here. What we need is a good dose of the love of God. Are you up for that? So just say, Lord, come. Come into my life afresh. Come into my life for the first time if necessary. I want to taste and see that you are good. Come in this congregation and those that may be watching. Come and fill with your presence and your power to the measure of the fullness of God. 
Just stay in his presence. Just stay where you are, either standing or seated. We hope you've enjoyed today's teaching. If you have any comments or prayer requests, please get in touch. God bless you.